Hi, I'm Tim. Join me in this video as we talk about some FAA requirements including registration, testing, and remote ID and see if they, reply to, if they apply to control line and free flight model aircraft. Let's get to it. Recently, one of my viewers of the YouTube channel wrote asking some questions about some of the new FAA requirements including testing, registration, remote ID, and safety codes and asked, do these apply to control line and free flight model aircraft? I thought about it and I said, that's a pretty good question. I don't know the answer right off the top of my head. So what I did was some research. This video, I'd like to give you some of my conclusions on to uh, what's going to happen to this. I'll give you a little bit of history, what I think is going to happen, and how the FAA is probably going to treat this in the future. The FAA has basically had a gentleman's agreement for years for the radio control model uh, aircraft community. Uh, back until the year 2000, 2005, generally speaking, we flew radio control model aircraft at club airfields. They were by and large gas powered. We stuck to those airfields, kept the models in visual flight, generally below 400 feet. And that worked well with the FAA. Plus back then, there just wasn't as much traffic as there is now. All that changed about 15, 20 years ago with the prevalence of uh, ready-made drones, uh, quadcopters. Uh, you could buy these at a, at a store. Nobody had to build them, take them out of box and fly them. Combined with the very powerful digital uh, video uh, and uh, still picture cameras, these drones allowed a lot of people to fly, sometimes at great distances to take pictures and do other activities. And they started interfering with manned aircraft operations. Today, the FAA keeps a database of this. There are approximately 100 incidents reported to the FAA per month, uh, things as important as shutting down major airports for 10 to 15 minutes due to observed drone aircraft um, in the area. So the FAA is aware that these drones, they call them unmanned aircraft systems. Um, in the language of the FAA, they use drones a lot. That's obviously reference to quadcopters. It applies also to radio control model aircraft that something had to be done I've got a series of videos on this. I'll put the grouping for my FAA videos on this. The FAA started in 2015 with a registration requirement. Uh, it's very easy to see on the FAA.gov website. You pay $5, you're registered for three years. For recreational pilots, you use the same registration for all your recreational aircraft. It's really quite easy. That um, extended into 2018. In 2018, there was a significant change. Their FAA um, Reauthorization Act of 2018, where Congress actually appropriates $16.5 billion or so to operate the FAA. With that, there's a tremendous amount of language the FAA has to follow, everything from uh, aircraft security, cockpit doors, to things that Congress has charged the FAA to do with unmanned, uh, small, small unmanned aircraft. And out of that, two things uh, that are significant to us was the trust test, which is the uh, recreational UAS safety tests that we have to take, as well as remote ID. So let's talk about those in a little bit more detail. So the first thing, when we're, there are five tasks we have to think about when we're going to go to the free flight and control line aircraft that we follow every day for our RC models or drones. The first thing we have to determine is our operation of the drone RC model or really any model, is that recreational or commercial? The FAA takes a very different view of anything commercially done with aviation versus recreational. You're a recreational flyer if all you do is go out and fly for your personal pleasure. You go out to your field, you fly, you go home. You don't do anything to help anybody else out. You don't take pictures of a high school football game. You don't offer pictures of uh, Christmas cards. You don't do anything other than just flying your aircraft. If you do anything besides recreation, your part 107. We're not talking about that in this video. We're just talking about recreational flyers. There's a little, there's a little checklist on that on the FAA.gov site. So this video will continue in the vein that you're a recreational flyer. The next thing you have to do out of five is register your model aircraft. I mentioned that before. Very easy to do with the FAA website. One registration number for all your recreational aircraft that describes markings, good for three years, $5. The other thing to keep in mind, you have to register aircraft that weigh more than 0.55 pounds, which is about 8.8 .8 ounces. That's just in the regulation. If you have a smaller model, like for example, my Guilo's Aronka Champ, this weighs just around three ounces. I do not have to register it because it's less than 8.8 .8 ounces. That'll be important because a lot of your free flight models could well be less than eight and a half ounces. We'll get to that later. 
The third out of five things you have to do is pass the TRUST test. TRUST stands for the Recreational UAS Safety Test. It was a multi-year effort, 53,000 comments from the users, et cetera. I've got a, a very comprehensive video on that. I can put the card up here. The TRUST test is taken for recreational flyers. It's a one-time test for your lifetime. It is free. It can be done online. It takes about 45 minutes. It's actually a pretty good test. You don't really test. It's more of a lecture series with some questions corrected to 100%. Everybody passed the test. When you've completed it, you're asked to give your name to put that onto the certificate that you print out or keep on your smartphone, and that is proof that you've taken the test. The way the law is written is, if law enforcement ever comes to a flying site, they can ask to see your trust test that is within the bounds of the law for them to do that. The fourth out of five things we have to do per the FAA is follow FAA or community-based organization, organization safety guidelines. Very easy to do with modelers. We just follow the AMA, the, Acad the Academy of Model Aeronautics gu Guidelines. The AMA is a completely accepted community-based organization by the FAA. If we're following the FAA guidelines, we're good to go. The fifth thing is remote ID. Remote ID is a huge uh, uh, discussion topic. I'll have a card up on remote ID. Basically what remote ID is, it's electronics on your model aircraft or drone that will let law enforcement know where the ground station is that you're operating the drone. There's other things that will happen as it expands. A lot to be determined on remote ID. The important thing is remote ID is not required for modelers until September 16th, 2023. So this is being filmed in August of 2021. There's still over two more years before you have to worry about remote ID. And what I've said in all my videos, love or hate remote ID, it's the rule from the FAA, and I truly believe they're going to come up with some very lightweight, innovative solutions to meet the remote ID requirement. So the question comes up, okay, on um, the original question, I'm flying a control line aircraft or a free flight aircraft. Do I have to comply with all of these requirements here? The answer is we don't know right now. My guess is that you are going to determine that you're a recreational flyer. I would say virtually every free flight and control line aircraft is a recreational flyer. You're probably going to have a registration somewhere for it. Just go ahead and get the registration. There's no harm in doing that, even for your free flight and control line aircraft. Again, if the aircraft weigh more than 8.8 ounces. You should pass the trust test. The reason I say that is an easy test to do. You learn stuff, but what happens? It gives you education so you don't inadvertently fly where you shouldn't fly. Two examples are to fly in controlled airspace. We need permission of the FAA. The trust test tells you how to do that by your smartphone. You could easily fly a free flight model in controlled airspace if you weren't aware of that. The other thing, unless there's a waiver, we have to stay below 400 feet. Again, the free flight models could get above that depending where you're flying. Another reason to have that trust test. Not so much for the control line aircraft because obviously due to the nature of the uh, control line aircraft. And finally, remote ID, too hard to say right now to be determined. So with those thoughts, background, what is going to happen in the future for um, free flight models and, control, uh, and um, control line aircraft? We know what's going to happen for the drones and the radar control aircraft. When you read the FAA language, it talks about operators, control, drones, unmanned aircraft. It, the idea is somebody's on the ground responsible for where this model is going. That will cover 99% of the flying. So what about a free flight control line model? The answer is a FAA advisory circular. So what happens is the FAA has a series of regulations. The, F, the regulations can be hard to understand even from people that study them a lot. Questions come up. So what will happen is these questions are asked to the FAA by, by knowledgeable people saying, we need your official interpretation. We want to follow the regs, but we can't quite figure out what's going on. So from the uh, source, advisory circulars are informational documents produced by the Federal Aviation Administration to inform and guide institutions and individuals within the aviation industry as well as the general public. They're intended to be informative in nature and not regulatory. However, many times they describe actions or advice the FAA expects to be implemented to follow. There's kind of a, a wiggle room there. They just can't write regulations at whim, but the advisory circulars, you really should be following the advisory circulars. And so I think what's going to happen is we're going to see an advisory circular on what to do for free flight or control line aircraft. It's a very valid question. 
I will be in contact with the AMA expressing this situation. I do believe the AMA will be in contact with the FAA. It's a valid thing to ask. And just to give you an example of an, um, the utility and benefit of these advisory circulars, and they can be multiple, multiple pages, is things are happening so quick. An absolute perfect example um, with commercial aviation and even private aviation is a thing called um, electronic flight bags. So when you fly commercial operations for sure, instrument um, flights, you have a flight bag with all sorts of approach plates, Jepson plates that are necessary to depart, operate, and fly via the instrument rules in the airspace system. These are pretty big bags that weigh a lot, typically on wheeled trolleys, but you had to have charts for the entire United States if you were flying uh, cross-country flights. What has happened starting in about 2017 or so, people started realizing that iPads and other tablets of that quality could be an electronic flight bag. Instead of having an entire bag that could weigh 30 pounds with papers that had to be updated periodically, what if we made those all electronic images on a flight pad? What about that? The idea was so compelling uh, that the FAA realized something had to be done. And what I find astounding to this day is an iPad, which was developed by Apple Computer with no FAA involvement whatsoever, is permitted to fly in instrument conditions with major airlines around the world due to a FAA advisory circular. It was AC number 120-76A on guidelines for the electronic flight bags and just what you do with the tablets to make these legal to fly with model uh, to fly with commercial aircraft. So as I was doing research for this video, guess what? I didn't know this. I stumbled upon an advisory circular. I'll put it up here and there'll be a link in the description that was from June 9th, 1981. That's 40 years ago on model aircraft operating standards right here. So again, it was a gentleman's agreement, very general. It said background modelers generally are concerned about safety to exercise good judgment in flying model aircraft. However, model aircraft can at times pose a hazard to full-scale aircraft in flight, to persons and property on the surface. Compliance with the following standards will help reduce the potential for that hazard, so forth. And there's basically five standards. Pick a good operating site away from populated areas. Do not operate model aircraft in the presence of spectators until the aircraft is successfully flight tested and proven airworthy. Do not fly higher than 400 feet above the ground or three miles from an airport. Give way to, right away, avoid flying in proximity of full-scale aircraft. Use observers if possible and don't hesitate to ask for help. So those are pretty general things. Again, before GPS and we're flying all the models on the ground, um, this, this is what it was. And it's kind of interesting. It's actually typed out on a typewriter. So that happened. Now, that has advanced. There is an updated advisory circular, uh, AC number 9157B. This is uh, six pages long, and it covers a lot more detail of, of model operations. I'll just give you a taste for this. This is in May of 2019. And you notice all what's running through all these advisory, advisory uh, circulars are safety. We want to allow people to operate the models, but not in a way that would ever affect the safety of passenger or, or, or human carrying aircraft. And they relate back to safety codes and all that stuff. And so what they talk about in this, just some of the highlights, is unmanned aircraft or aircraft without a human pilot on board. They are controlled by an operator on the ground. Notice that nothing mentioned about free flight or control land aircraft, hence the need for some clar clarification. But operators flying unmanned aircraft can endanger other aircraft, people, property by flying recklessly without due regards to risks. Additionally, most unmanned aircraft manufactured for recreational use are not tested by the FAA for airworthiness. No assurance will fly safely, especially when encountering unexpected circumstances such as radio interference, winds, power failures. That could apply to free flight or control line aircraft. So the FAA assumes that the pilots are concerned about safety. They intend to provide a process for recognizing community-based organizations. The FAA feels the community-based organizations are extremely important for reaching out to these flyers. The AMA is the one for us. Um, the aircraft is flown strictly for recreational purposes. Um, it is flown within visual line of sight of people operating on the ground or a visual observer co-located with, co with the aircraft. Aircraft is operated in a manner that does not interfere with, gives way to any manned aircraft, stay out of controlled airspace without permission, 
uh, Class G airspace uncontrolled, less than 400 feet, and you've passed an aeronautical knowledge and safety test. So pretty clear, no changes from our RC or UAV. Does this apply to control line or um, free flight aircraft to be determined? I do believe there'll be an advisory circular, but for now, for sure, take the trust test. It does no harm to um, register it. And the real, and we're going to follow community-based organizations anyhow, and the real uh, discussion point will be remote ID. We'll find out about that two years from now, and hopefully there'll be some advisory circular guidance at that point. So I thank you for watching. Uh, good luck with your flying, and we will see you in the next video.